<laughs> well, how do you want to start? You tell me. Okay. Um, well, this has really uh, been a journey, and uh, Bon wrote a, a wonderful book. Study. Study. How long ago? I'm honestly asking because I think it's been. I think um, it was, I don't know. 10 years ago? More than 10 years ago. Wow. Yeah. 2010, I think. And that's been circulated. You've done it now here at the church three times, four times. A couple, I'm not sure. And um, other churches have picked it up. And. Um, God's really blessed it, his word for wives. And so you're kind of looking at me with those eyes, you know, sort of like, where's the study for the husbands? I never said that. And Other women his word, said that. I never yeah. Said that. Okay. <laughs> and so here we are. And uh, over the course of the next uh, several months we're going to do this thing and some of the some of the nights will combine like we are tonight be together um, but we'll get right at it and just kind of talk about some things that we all share in common but then there'll be some times where I'll meet with the guys and just kind of talk through some husband stuff and you'll meet with the gals and just kind of talk through some some wife stuff but really with the heart of ultimately making the marriage stronger. And um, we'll kind of go over that uh, with you. But I think if you're looking for a kind of a Hallmark Channel thing, this ain't it. <laughs> Can I say that? Mm -hmm. This ain't it. Have we ever watched the Hallmark Channel? Like once, ever? Mm -hmm. No. So I don't, I don't think you would enjoy it. I don't, think, I don't know. Um, I, I think, I, I really pray that, and those worship songs were just spot on, because I think so much of what uh, we're going to share tonight, how we want to start this thing, is what we just sang. So, good on you. And great glass game, too, you got going. Uh, this is going to be real, it's going to be raw, it's going to be honest, and I pray with all my heart it's going to be helpful, whether you're not married, but thinking about getting married. Um, newly married, um, or you've been married a long time like we have, 35 years now, and yet still kind of figuring it out. And I think most of the victories are humbling in marriage. Most of the victories are, you know, are not like, Whoo. most of the victories are exhausting. And most of the victories are humbling. And most of the struggles are actually what end up strengthening us. And, um, and we just kind of want to just be really honest and transparent with you about it. We'll probably cry. Bon usually does. Just a spoiler alert. Everything's fine. It's okay. There's a defibrillator in the back. If, if, I go down, but uh, like our honeymoon was over in five days, and and actually your hair melted on the honeymoon. I had long hair, straight up long hair, and we were in a jeep, and like three days in, <laughs> it all fell out. It didn't fall out, it just glued together. It glued together lump. and we cut it off. And it was, I'm like, what in the, the world? It was the early 90s. This? There was perms going on, there was, was a lot going on. It, a lot of damage. And, and I think really what, what Paul says here in Ephesians, he's, he says that marriage is a profound mystery. And that, that's as spot on as the worship tonight has been. And you're here tonight uh, because you believe in the miracle of the whole deal. And we want to celebrate that with you. But in just being honest, it, it's um, probably one of the most difficult 
things that you'll ever encounter. Certainly one of the most significant human relationships is this blessing that God has given us uh, and, and, and gifted us the blessing of one another. And yet at the same time, expectation uh, can be a powerful lens. Um, and if you kind of enter into marriage and all of a sudden the hair melts or falls out, falls out. <laughs> um, expecting it to be one thing only to find out that it's something else entirely different can, can color the day. It can, it can affect the whole relationship. And we use words like soulmate. And that puts a lot on the whole deal or, or the one, you know, he's the one, she's the one. And uh, a lot of books, we'll recommend some for you tonight and, and some that are in the bookshop waiting for you, some you can grab online. Those types of expectations kind of begin to create this underlining belief that in order for the marriage to work, we have to find the perfect person. And then if something goes wrong and the wheels come off and, and, and quickly we realize this ain't perfect. Um, that's why the divorce rate is as high as it is. And some would feel that as a result of the unmet expectations or the misconceptions that divorce then becomes the only legal solution because we've just become so crazy tolerating of it as if it could ever be said that there aren't gonna be differences between us. We're different, we're so different. And so, I don't know, we're, we're gonna start at Forest Home, that's where we met. And okay. just kinda roll that out. Sure. We met at Forest Home. We did, we met at a Forest Home, which was a Christian camp and conference center in the San Bernardino Mountains. Um, I was blessed to be raised in a Christian home, we both were, mm -hmm. um, but at 17 I was volunteering at that camp and I recommitted my life and so the next summer I went back and uh, served on staff at a part of the camp that at the time was called Indian Village mm -hmm. and I was in Indian Village West and I was aware of an older, older, Careful. much older, um, <laughs> brilliant guy who went by the name of it was an Indian village, so he went by the name of Southpaw. I legitimately did not know his real name. Or that I was left-handed. I did not know Southpaw meant left-handed, okay. which is really sad because I am also left-handed. <laughs> um, genius right out of the gate. Um, but he was out of my league. I was a low-level staffer, and he was chief of the village. Actually wore the headdress, everything. I have pictures. Or? Maybe. Should have brought them. Um, but the following summer, um, I was, uh, it was staff orientation. Before summer really got going, I was in the clubhouse. I was at the counter ordering a hot fudge sundae. And this guy that I'd heard about, and I'd heard him speak, but I didn't really know him, came right up to me and said, would you like me to tape that to your hips? And um, <laughs> true story. Tape that to your hips. Says the guy wearing the bachelor's. That was huge. First till. of all, we're having Sundays tonight, but this thing was like, I'm like, really, you're gonna eat that? Because you're like tiny, petite little thing, and this is like. Mm -hmm. He's wearing a T-shirt that says "Bachelor Till the Rapture," I was. and I, <laughs> I'm thinking, I was quite the sassy little thing, and I'm thinking. Okay, of course you're gonna be a bachelor forever. <laughs> but I have to admit, I was also thinking, hey, this guy's kind of fun. Um, so I said, well, excuse me, but yes, I am going to eat the whole thing. 
And he said, well, I need to watch this. So we sat down, and he watched me eat every single bite <laughs> of that Sunday down to the last bit. Um, and we started talking uh, at that point and continued talking. And I was, in all, honestly, you know, 19-year-old girl, I was seriously on the hunt for a Christian husband. Um, and I was looking for a man who loved God's word. And over time, I began to see this is a young man who truly loves God's word because he was always telling me um, how much time he spent in it. Um, I would see him at dinner and he would say, wow, I just spent a couple hours in the Word and I am so refreshed. And I would see him sometimes in the morning and he would say, yesterday was such a long, hard day, but I spent eight full hours in the Word and I am fully restored. I did. And um, I will say that he truly does love and serve the Lord with all his heart. Um, but one of the other things that was so attractive to me about him was his sense of humor. So it was not a total surprise when years later, after we were married, after we were married, <laughs> that he happened to share with me that that particular summer was the summer that he named his bed the Word. Yeah, the bunk bed mm -hmm. was called the Word. So a full night of eight hours in the Word was totally restorative. Um, seriously, <laughs> I fell in love um, with a brilliant and godly young man who loved the Lord with his whole heart, and I've been incredibly blessed to sit under his teaching since I was 18. <laughs> there's, our, there's our love story in a nutshell. I... Um... I'm fortunate that she took me at all. I was a knucklehead. And, um, and we didn't really have much else in common except the Lord. You hate travel, I love travel. You hate being cold, that's where hockey typically is played. You hate spicy food with a passion. I, I, I couldn't be more opposite. You hate being up here on the stage right now. You hate to ski. You hate massages. You hate Indian food. You honestly don't particularly enjoy flowers all that much or jewelry. I had my work cut out for me. I was just kind of like, this is going to be challenging, but um, Lewis calls it a secret thread. And we began to realize that we did have more things in common. And a friendship began to grow. And out of that a love genuinely for one another and a deep appreciation. She's the most brilliant and articulate gal I know. And um, we named it Second Marriage and are going to meet on the second Sunday of each month because that's what this is. And we were out for a walk one day in Cardiff and she's done this whole deal and she's kind of looking at me as to when is the husband thing gonna come along? And I just kind of looked at her on a walk one day and I said, I'm your second marriage. And she's like, what? And didn't get it really, honestly, at first. That was quite a revelation. <laughs> and I just sort of felt like what the Lord was impressing upon me for this whole series and really what you've been saying in your study the whole time is that he comes first. And the whole description of this deal that Paul rolls out for us in Ephesians puts the priority and the preeminence on exactly what we all just sang together in, in making him first and realizing that I, I come second. And the moment you got it is the moment it clicked. And that is what I think has actually become for us in giving Lewis the credit, the, the secret thread that has held us together. 
um, even when things were super rocky and, and not healthy at all. But um, the Lord blessed us immeasurably and given us three absolutely incredible kids. And now these grandkids. And um, if you remember back, this is kind of like the old school guy. This is BK, which would be before Kindle. Um, there's this binding that holds all the pages together and, and it's, it's unseen, but absolutely essential. And that thread really for us has become the identity of our marriage and family. And um, certainly our, our love for the Lord and for his word and, and for each other. And it's hard to find ever there to be a time without bond. She loves, I gave you the list of the things that she hates, which, which she loves is her family. She loves this church. She loves the Lord and she loves to read. And it, it became obvious to me that um, even though I think we had a, a pretty rocky start, I was clueless. Um, what we have gleaned and what we have gained through the things that the Lord has been faithful um, to show us, the differences that were so glaringly obvious at, at the start uh, certainly were replaced with the things that we had in common. And um, I was gone speaking and traveling and probably close to 70 of the first 100 days we were married. And I remember meeting Sarah Johnson before Sarah became Armendaris at a conference center that I was speaking at up in the Sequoias called Quaker Meadows. And it was actually one of the leaders in Sarah's church that pulled me aside and said, where's your wife? What, what are you doing? Why are you guys apart? And, and the, the, the issue of making her my ministry, of making her my priority, it took a, a long time to finally uh, sink into this thick skull. And then um, we began from there to start really seeking the Lord together and, and getting on our knees in our little apartment in Ocean Beach, on our knees at the end of the bed and just really crying out to God and and begging him for a work of restoration. You got some thoughts on that? Well, I think um, what we're stepping into in this study, um, when you step into marriage, it's a, it's a spiritual battle. Um, it really is. It's true warfare, and the enemy has made marriage, especially Christian marriage, a target. Um, and he's had great success, and he continues to have great success, and he does not give up. And in spite of our shared faith, um, he almost took us out in our early years. And I was really on my heart before we step into this battle, tonight being the introduction, to prepare ourselves for it um, and give you a few minutes um, before the Lord, um, independently, on your own, in the quiet of your heart. It's not about him. It's not about her. It's about him. Um, that is, that is what changed everything for me. And so if you came in here today and you dragged either literally or figuratively him, little H, or her, little H, with you, um, now is when you set that completely aside because this is about here, we are here to focus on you and the Lord and your relationship with him. Um, it's about him, it's about his truth, 
It's about his word and the relationship that he desires to have with you. First and foremost, your first marriage is as the bride of Christ. And um, that's what we're here to talk about. Your second marriage is blessed because of your first marriage. Um, and so I just want to read a couple of verses and just give you a moment to come before the Lord and ask him to prepare your heart because as you really dig into God's word and what he has called us to in marriage, um, it's harder for some than others, I know that. Um, but there's hard things in God's word because of the way we have been influenced um, in our lives and by the culture around us. And so I just want to uh, read a couple of verses and give you a moment to pray. Proverbs 3, 3 through 7. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for this time. Thanks for these marriages. Thanks for meeting us here. Meet us right where we are. And thank you, Lord, that um, your word can become a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, and a guaranteed success for our marriages. And so we want to lean in and discover what you have in store for us as husbands, as wives, as families that are desiring, Lord, to put you first and to be a bride for you that puts a smile on your face, Lord, that you're constantly telling us throughout the pages of Scripture that you unconditionally love us and are preparing to return and sweep us off of our feet to forever be joined with you. And so may that relationship, uh, Lord, be honored in our marriages, guarded uh, in our hearts, as the greatest, most precious gift we have ever been given. Just pour your spirit upon these marriages in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're very fortunate that Paul gives us the secret and says to us here in the scriptures that the key is in laying your life down. And a joy that surpasses happiness will be experienced in your life and marriage. And ultimately the whole thought that, that the aim of it all really isn't happiness. That should be the byproduct of it, but ultimately the aim is the holy work that God is doing in all of us and in our hearts. And so obviously we want to start tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 
and just be reminded of this beautiful description of love, this agape love that the Lord has for us. And he says that if we don't have it, we're like this clanging cymbal or a piece of sound in brass. That even if I have the gift of tongues, but I have not love, it's nothing. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, but I have no love. Even if I have the faith to remove mountains, it comes to nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. You're like, come on, man. It's failing left and right. That's man that's failing. His love never fails. And you can take these things and look at the opposite of each one of them. Not being patient or suffering long, not being kind, instead being envious, parading one's self, being puffed up. This, this is where the divorces are lined up at the door. The opposite of each is why marriages fail. It's like simple economics. It's supply and demand. And your life and the love with which you bestow requires a tank to run on. And the opposite of all of these things that would define God's perfect love is what ends up sucking us dry. And that's the duping lie of the devil. That we think that we're gonna be fulfilled when we're putting ourselves first. The, the pride of it all, the self-centeredness of it all, but that ends up robbing us, leaves us empty and blind. And so I think here is the real key and much of which we'll un unpack together. Turn to 2 Corinthians. You all know that passage from 1 Corinthians rather well, I'm certain, but here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I, I love what he says. And it kind of reminds me a bit here at a night and being here together. And, and uh, it really circles all the way back to forced home, Tim and Cindy, and being with you guys and serving on staff together. And, and um, I look at verse 13. This is a classic life verse of mine because I'm still pretty much a knucklehead. I look at this verse. For if we are beside ourselves... It is for God. Like if we just end up sitting on these stools, making an absolute fool of ourselves. This is for God. We didn't sign up for this. I never applied for this job. If we're beside ourselves, it's, it's for him. But if, if, if we're of sound mind, it's for you. If anything makes sense, something you can grab hold of, you got an unbelieving spouse and you're wondering what this series is gonna say to you. Anything that is rooted and grounded 
in Scripture for the challenges that we all face in marriage. We're not taking credit for it. We're not sitting up here as experts and kind of patting ourselves on the back. We're so good. No, we have fights all the time. And um, and sometimes we are actually beside ourselves. But if once in a while something good comes out, it's for you, to the glory of God. For the love of Christ compels us. You see this verse? Look at, look at these. I think they are as solidly clutch for us to cling to and hold on to than, than 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which can be for a lot of us rather lofty. And so here he breaks it down and says this, the love of Christ compels us. Hang in there for his sake. Hang in there together for his sake, for his glory, for the glory of his name. The greatest thing you could ever do for your wife, guys, is love God with all your heart. Put him first in your life. That's the best gift that I can give to her. Greatest thing a wife could ever do for her husband is to love God with all her heart. The best thing we could ever do for our kids is not make the kids the center of our world, but to show the kids that he is the center of our family. The greatest thing that I've ever been able to bestow upon my kids is my love for their mom. And so here he says this, he says, for the love of Christ compels us, hang in there, For his name's sake. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, and here's here's the key, then all died. He died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That's the guaranteed, without question, key to you not just surviving, but succeeding in marriage. Die to yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. That's what he means in verse 17, the first verse I ever learned there in the village. If anyone is in Christ, becomes a Christian, he's, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And here's why marriage is under such an attack. Here's this whole gender agenda. Because we have been made in his image. And we have been made and molded to give him glory. We've, made, we've been made in his image for his glory, not for our own. And so this for us becomes the absolute clutch and key to his word for husbands, as well as uh, his word for wives. And I'm gonna throw it back to you, but here's one more verse. Uh, marriage 101, look at Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. Did you have this one? I don't want to step on your toes. Matthew chapter 16. There in verse 24, at the very end of Matthew chapter 16, Jesus then said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Guys, what profit is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, 
and then reward each according to his works. And so, yeah. When he says, seek first the kingdom of God, he means put him first. It's your first marriage. And this is your second. And your second will run a lot better when he's your first. And it'll never run the way it's supposed to until he becomes first. So we, we grabbed every domain we possibly could. Hisword.com, grabbed it. Secondmarriage.org, grabbed it. And we just want to kind of wrap our arms around your marriages together this year and build something both with the homework that Bon has and what together we as husbands could glean and gather together and build marriages to the glory of his name. Amen? If you're seeking anything other than him, you get neither. But if you'll seek him first, he promises all of these things will be added to you. Get it all when you put him first. I think if you're married tonight um, and you might be in any different place, you might be very struggling and you're here because you're wondering if there's hope. You're, you might be, well, it's fine. Um, or you might be thinking it can't get any better than it is. Um, and the thing that I love about God and about his word is he's never done. There's always more. And so as you continue to grow and apply his word and seek his will, it can get better and better and better and better. And, and that is truly what we've experienced. And what excites me about this is knowing that as we go through it again, God will do a new work in our marriage and make it even better than before. Um, and he took something broken and that I thought was dead and he brought it back to life um, and more abundant life than I ever, ever pictured marriage could be. Um, God's word is truth and it is relevant and it applies to everyone, regardless of where you find yourselves. Um, and, and there are some hard truths, as I said earlier, in these verses on marriage. At least I felt that way when I started saying, okay, Lord, what does your word tell me about my role as a wife? And I started to try and live out those verses. Um, and I thought, this is tough stuff. This is, this is not uh, what I was picturing. It goes contrary to the world. It's not politically correct. It is contrary to culture, and I didn't realize how ingrained in me culture was until I really sat with these verses and asked God to show me what he had for me in them. But what I began to realize over time is that these are not hard truths. These are beautiful truths. They're God's truth. Um, he has given us wonderful roles. Um, he wants to bless us. These verses bring, bring freedom. They bring abundance, they bring peace, they bring joy, they bring true fulfillment, and this is the only place that you can find that in marriage. We believe, and this church teaches, as you know if you come here, um, that the word of God is true. Um, that every bit of it was inspired by him, and that it is relevant today, and we are called to live by it in complete obedience. Um, and that the greatest blessings that can ever be found are found by being obedient to God's word. I not only believe it, I feel like God proved it to me through the transformation that he did in our marriage. Um, and this is a marriage study, but God's word can transform every area of your life if you dig into it and seek to apply it and obey it. Um, and that is what gets me so excited about doing this study again. So Psalm 51, 17 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. What we all desire, whether we're married or not, is a joyful and blessed marriage. It's just something, a desire that I think um, God has put in us. Um, and what does it require to have that joyful and blessed marriage? It requires being broken. Um, and I really mean that. You need to be broken. And it's not just marriage. 
This is what calls us to as followers in all areas, as Bob was just saying. We have to die to ourselves. We die to our flesh. Um, and that death is what brings abundant life. Um, for I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And in this marriage, this area of marriage, our flesh wants to keep fighting for our dreams, our desires, our wants, our needs. But we take all of those things, we lay them at his feet, and we just ask him to give what he wants to give us in return. And as I've said over and over, it's not just about marriage. This is about being a follower of Christ. And it is my failed marriage that taught me how to be a follower of Christ. There's a, a couple of quotes and we'll throw them up on, on the websites and you can just be able to download them and, and pull them off as well as any of the notes of the scriptures that we've looked at this evening. But maybe you, um, you feel as if you're in the midst of some unsolvable puzzle, you're wondering where it's gonna go, you're kinda like this corn maze has no out or in or what to do and, and, um, and so just, just some thoughts tonight and then we'll kind of break down the curriculum of what things are gonna look like over the course of the next several months and um, enjoy some Sundays together. Stan Hauerwas is a professor at uh, university and uh, has said some incredible things uh, in terms of kind of helping just to peel back what oftentimes can end up smelling like a stinky onion. And the layers of it all, he says, can ultimately end up creating things that are destructive. And he says, he says this, destructive to marriage is the self-fulfillment ethic that assumes that marriage and family are primarily to be institutions of personal fulfillment, necessary for us to become whole and to be happy. If I'm looking to her to complete me, in the words of Jerry Maguire, I am looking in the wrong place. And the miracle of marriage isn't that two halves become a whole. The miracle is that two whole people who are complete in Christ become one. And uh, Howard West does a great job of just kind of breaking this down for us. And, and it says, the assumption is that there is someone just right for us to marry. And that if we look closely enough, we will find the right person. This moral assumption overlooks a crucial aspect to marriage and fails to appreciate the fact that we all end up marrying the wrong person. We never know whom we marry. We just think we do. Or even if we first marry the right person, just give it a while. For he or she will certainly change. For marriage, being the enormous thing that it is, we are not the same person after we have entered it. And the problem comes in learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. And that was kind of like, surprise, <laughs> I think to both of us. And then you begin to sort of put these protective guards over your heart. Lewis says you love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung out and possibly broken. If you wanna make sure that you keep your heart intact, give your heart to no one, not even an animal. 
Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries and avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or a coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, in that coffin, safe and dark and motionless and airless, your heart will change. It will not be broken, it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable, and the alternative to tragedy, or at least the risk, is damnation. And he's just sort of like, wow, okay, so open up in this series to a new work that God is wanting to do in you. And, and, and don't be like the guy who's like, I've got to get my wife there. This is for you. Don't be like the wife who's like, I'm making sure my husband's in there. And, and, and a lot of what we kind of want to share with you right now in terms of where we're headed and, and the curriculum to which we're going to cover in the material, we're almost reluctant to do so because as a wife, you're going to be looking at it saying, have you read this yet? Have you looked at this yet? Have you done your homework yet? Have you, right? And some of it, honestly, that we're going to look together at as, as wives is between the wives and the Lord. And um, some of the things that we'll look together as, as husbands is between that husband and the Lord. And so you want to kind of roll out what you're going to be looking at? You want me to? Or you want me to? Guys, we're going to start with uh, a husband's love. And just kind of uh, realizing that as men, sometimes this can be... Um, where loneliness ends up experiencing revival. When you realize the husband's role in this whole thing. So October is a husband's love. And that's Ephesians chapter five. Husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. It's not leaving it up to you to define how that love looks. He's saying, Husbands, love your wives. And so October, we're going to talk about love. And then November, we're going to talk about leadership, how a husband is to lead. And then in December, we're going to be combined back together, Lord willing, as couples. And we're going to talk about what we've learned through the course of this fall. And then in January, I'll be with the husbands again for uh, some limits and, and primarily limiting lust. And, and the January session is gonna be fire. So you might wanna mark that one down of all of them. And we will look at limiting the lies of lust. And then in February, uh, husbands, uh, labor. And just kind of the whole work ethic that we bring into the home and into the marriage. So October love, November lead, December learn, January limiting lust, February labor, March lips, the power of the tongue. And then we'll wrap this thing up in, a, in April, combine together as couples and talk about the legacy of our marriage. And, and a, really a, a couple of ideas for you to roll into October with. I'd like you to look up every verse in the Bible that speaks to husbands. It's an easy word study. You could do it tonight, but find those verses with me that pertain specifically and speak to our role as husbands. Uh, in addition to that, I'm loving Levi Lusco's latest marriage devotional. If you want to grab that, 
uh, Jeannie and Levi are great friends, have a wonderful church up in Montana and just put together Fresh Off the Press, a pretty cool marriage devotional. There's also a book called Naked Marriage by Willis uh, that you might want to pick up as well as um, uh, Gottman's book on the seven principles. And I think we'll have recommendations for you uh, just about every time uh, that we gather together. But that, that'll, that'll get the guys going. I think sometimes we look around and we see people and they seem happy and our imagination kind of fills in that maybe their marriage is so much better than, than ours. And, and I'm telling you that there are no two people ever that are married to each other that get along 100% of the time. Um, there are no two people who completely understand each other. Um, there's no man that was ever created who meets every want and need of his wife. There's no woman who's done the same for her husband because only the Lord can do that. And I think when we put the expectations of what uh, we should be receiving from the Lord on a person, it can put a burden on the relationship that can be crushing. Um, only God can do for us what we sometimes expect someone else to do. And even when we're doing great, even when we're walking in obedience to his word, we can't lower our guard. Uh, no, matter, no matter what, we can't lower our guard because the enemy never gives up. Um, and decades later, um, our marriage is a gift and a joy and a delight and an encouragement. Preach it. And it is um, exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what I ever dreamt that marriage could be. Come on. Um, but I will tell you something the Lord showed me just recently, a way that he humbled me. Um, and I have a point. Um, I have a husband who uh, has laid down his life. Um, he loves me the way Christ loved the church in many ways, and he has laid down his wants and his desires um, for me so many times and in so many ways. And, and rather than responding all the time in love and gratitude and a desire to be the wife that he uh, wants me to be, I've ta I take it for granted. This is just the kind of husband that he is. I've grown to expect it. Um, I become selfish and I find that I just want more of that. Um, and I say that um, because I'm not sitting up here in pride before you and saying that we've got it all figured out. I sit up here in humility as a fellow or struggler, but I also say that because as I was repenting before the Lord of my selfishness that I cannot seem to fully destroy, I felt like he spoke a truth to my heart that, um, that is something that we all do um, in our first marriage. Um, this is what so many of us do to him because we take what he has done for us, the literal laying down of his position in heaven, the literal laying down of his life on the cross, and we take it for granted. It's just what he does. Um, it's expected, and I, don't, I am not constantly in awe and appreciation of what he's actually done for me, the love that he has displayed. Um, I become selfish with him as if what he has already done isn't enough. And I just keep coming back to him and asking for more instead of falling on my knees and saying, Lord, what can I do for you? Who do you want me to be? How do you want me to walk? And as a husband, he wants you to be a husband as unto the Lord. As a wife, he wants you to be a wife, not as unto a man that you might be disappointed in or frustrated with. Be a wife as unto the Lord, according to scripture. Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that it is from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So what I did so many years ago um, was I took Every verse, as he just told the men to do, I found every verse I could that had to do with the role of a wife in scripture. And I found 60 of them 
uh, in about 15 sections of scripture. I don't claim to be authority uh, on it, but those were the ones that I found. And I took them and I divided them up into categories and began to seek to apply them um, to our marriage. And so these are the six categories that we'll be looking at as wives. First, we start with the foundation and purpose of marriage. I thought it was all about me and romance and love and family, and that's not what God's word says it is. Those are the outcome of it when it's done according to his will. So we start there, and then we go to sweet submission. Now, I put sweet in front of it because I thought maybe that would make it a little more attractive. Um, But also because we are supposed to be sweet in our submission. Um, And then there were so many verses on submission, I had to keep going. And the next time is sweet submission and sweet silence. Apparently, the two frequently go together. And then we spend an entire week on another uh, week of sweet silence. Uh, We spend a week on sweet sex. Again, put the word sweet in front of it. Um, And then we close with the commitment, uh, the legacy, as you put it. Mm -hmm. And I do have two books uh, for the women that I want to recommend. And we do have them for you tonight in the bookshop. You can go home and get started right away. Um, The booklet, the um, His Word for Wives, is ready to go off the printer. We just finished printing um, 550 plus of our Acts study that we start Tuesday morning. Um, And then again on Wednesday. Um, So the printer is now, we do all of this in-house and the printer is now ready to go um, to print out his word for wives in an updated, um, edited form. And that will be available shortly along with um, what the men are gonna be looking at. But the recommended books for women, and I hesitate to even say this in front of the men, But the the recommended books for women are two of them. There's one called Liberated Through Submission by P.B. Wilson. And then there's another book. It's called For Women Only by Shanti Feldhahn. And um, so I want to encourage you to grab those and dive in um, and be excited for the miracles that God is going to do. Yeah, I think the last one would be Tim Keller. And uh, Tim's with the Lord now in heaven. Uh, we miss him greatly and uh, so much appreciated uh, his ministry and his heart of pouring into marriages and um, uh, Kathy's still going at it and uh, bless her, just incredible. But Tim and Kathy have a number of books on marriage. Uh, Tim in one of his books says, you feel attracted to the other person as I did to Bon when I met her at Forest Home, and there she was, the lifeguard. And I hung out at the pool, man, I'm telling you what. I did the whole drowning thing in like the three foot end, and she (laughs) saved me. And uh, and Keller says, that's how it starts all your stories. If we kind of just had open mic tonight, just talked about your attraction and how you guys met and love for the other person and how... You just thought he was so wonderful. She was so beautiful. Everything was so perfect. But then Keller says, a year or even a month for us, like five days. Five days in. Three things begin to happen. Number one you start to realize how selfish this wonderful person is. (laughs) Number two, they're experiencing the same experience that you're experiencing in how selfish you are. And number three, though you acknowledge it in part, you're quick to conclude that their selfishness is far more problematic (laughs) than yours, especially if you've had a hard life and a lot of hurt. You begin to say things like, "You, you just don't understand me. And 
begin to minimize the work that he's wanting to do in you. And I think that is absolutely so clutch in what we wanted to start with tonight. Just be open to the work that God is wanting to do in you. We both have sufficiently brought problems to the party. And kind of unpacking those together and holding each other through the process of now what the Lord is faithful to perform and accomplish is going to be a glorious thing for us all to behold. And just letting his spirit move and work a fresh, miraculous, powerful, healing, restoring, completing and perfecting work that he promises to do even unto the day of Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so we, we believe in, in hugs. Hugs work, oh, we've tried hugs, don't work. Hugs work. And we firmly believe in prayer. Prayer works. You know, we tried prayer too, man, prayer didn't work. Prayer works. We believe in the power of God's word. It never returns void. The key is dying to yourself. And it's really where the healing work of restoration can start in your marriage. And not pointing the finger and saying, I'll die if you die. (laughs) But just be open to the work that God's wanting to do in you. And it will be a front row seat of joy and blessing as the miracles begin to unfold. And you experience not only the work he's doing in you, but the work that he's doing in your beautiful spouse. And so pick up your cross and follow him and let him do the work that he's wanting to do in you. You wanna pray for us? Sure. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. Um, We're here to seek your will for marriage, whether we're single and wanting to know how, Lord, do I find your will for me in this, or whether you're married, and wherever you are in that journey. Lord, I pray that you would give us tonight the strength to be humble, to set aside our thoughts and feelings and emotions, Lord, to not trust in those things, but to trust in you, in your plan, in your purposes, in your will, Lord, it takes faith to trust that as we give up all those things that we are holding on to, as we open our hands and give them to you completely and totally and surrender them to die to ourselves, Lord, in all of those areas, to seek your kingdom first, Lord, that takes faith that you are a God who loves us that you are a God who created us and who created this relationship and only your will for it will accomplish the blessings that you desire for it to be. So Lord, may we surrender tonight, surrender it all and come together in these coming months to seek your face, to seek your will, to study your word, to allow your Holy Spirit to reveal to us individually, Lord, because no two marriage is alike. No two marriages here tonight have the same issues, the same problems, the same joys, but your Holy Spirit sees it all and knows which way we should walk, what we should say, how we should say it, what we should lay down, what we should pick up. May we listen to that still small voice saying, turn right, turn left, speak in love, hold your tongue. Lord, may we truly come before you tonight in complete surrender in response to your love for us, Lord. May we love you right back, knowing in faith that your blessings will be poured out in ways that we cannot even comprehend. 
I pray, Lord, that the heart that is here tonight that is struggling to let go, that is struggling to do anything but blame someone else, Lord, I pray that that heart would be softened and opened before you tonight to receive your will, to receive your spirit, and to hear your voice. Lord, I know that lives can be changed for all of eternity because what we are about to do in applying your word, may we hold fast to that with joy and excitement in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.